It was my best friend Luke's idea to form our own detective agency, inspired by the shows we loved watching together. We lived on Brook Street in a small town in Oregon, so we called ourselves the Brook Street Sleuths. We advertised our services on the community board in Elmer's Market, which usually cost 25 cents a week, but Mr. Elmer kindly allowed it for free. We worked on various cases in the space of a month or so, over one summer. Who's been taking the blackberries from Miss Jacob's brambles? Solved. Almost everyone who passed by, and lots of chipmunks. What made the small hole in Lowry's front yard? Solved. A chipmunk. Yeah, we had an abundance of chipmunks in town. But not all the mysteries involved the little critters. They were clearly not mysteries to the adults who hired us. But the best thing about living in that kind of community was the willingness of our neighbours to contribute to our idea of fun. Luke and I were rewarded with many sodas and candy bars for our sleuthing skills. Despite our success rate, the Brook Street Sleuths was a short-lived agency. Our last ever case began with a very real mystery. Where is Mr. Page's dog? Frank Page was a retired widower and happened to be my next door neighbor. His dog, Milo, a Yorkie, was what Frank referred to as a pain in the proverbial. Milo was an expert escape artist. He was always getting out of the yard and causing mischief in town, but would usually come back home with his tail wagging after an hour or two. One evening, we could hear Frank calling for Milo from the doorstep. He had escaped as per, but it had been several hours and he still hadn't returned. My dad offered to drive around the neighborhood to look for him, but had no luck. The next morning, I helped Frank make a missing poster. We stuck a photograph of Milo on a sheet of paper using a glue stick, and I neatly wrote the details underneath in black marker as dictated by Frank. Then we went to Elmer's Market to use the photocopier and made 10 copies. It should have cost us a dollar, but Mr. Elmer said there was no charge and wished us luck in finding him. Frank bought me a cola as a thank you. You're a good kid, Ricky, he said, patting my back. I could hear he was upset. We'll find him, Mr. Page, I said. The Brook Street sleuths are on the case. He chuckled. He's a piece of work, but I'd be lost without him. I'll go knock for Luke just as soon as we've put up these posters. We left one on the board in Elmer's then stuck the remaining posters on telegraph poles and the two bus shelters in town. I asked Frank if I could keep hold of the original photograph of Milo. That way, I could show it to the local residents during our investigation. Before I knocked for Luke, I went back home to tell my parents. Don't wander too far, Ricky, said Mom, and stay out of the woods. I don't like the thought of you boys in there alone. There was a woodland area that lined the back of town. I absolutely planned on looking in there. I told my mum I wouldn't though, of course. I grabbed my bike and rode to Luke's to fill him in on the details. There, we rode around town and knocked on doors, asking if they'd seen Milo. It was mostly unsuccessful. But one lady had some potentially useful information. Now that I think about it, she said on the doorstep, I did see a little dog sniffing around the brambles on Maple Road yesterday. Thank you, ma'am, said Luke. We discussed it as we retrieved our bikes from the end of the driveway. There are two houses on Maple Road with brambles in the yard, he said. Miss Jacobs, I said, and the Deans. Why did it have to be the Deans? The Dean family were not known for their warm community spirit, especially the oldest son, Tommy. He was a senior and notorious troublemaker who had caused Luke and I a lot of grief. The family also had a much bigger, meaner dog 
that would probably treat Milo as a snack. We'll go to Miss Jacob's house first, said Luke. If we're lucky, we won't have to go to the Dean's at all. We left our bikes on the sidewalk and knocked on Miss Jacob's door. Well, she said warmly, if it isn't the Brook Street sleuths. Hello, Miss Jacobs, we said in unison. What can I do for you boys? We're looking for my neighbor, Mr. Page's dog, I said, showing her the photo. He went missing yesterday afternoon. Oh no, she said. I'm familiar. I sometimes see him in the yard by the Brambles, but I haven't seen him for days. Thank you anyway, Miss Jacobs, said Luke. Of course, she said. I'll keep my eye out. Oh, and help yourselves to blackberries. As we walked down Miss Jacobs' pathway, we looked at each other with concern, knowing we now had to visit the Deans. We took the opportunity to eat a few of the ripened berries before braving it, then wheeling our bikes to their house. The yard wasn't as kempt as the others in the neighborhood. It was overgrown and there were scraps of metal from various vehicles dotted around like a junkyard. We slowly walked up the path. As soon as we knocked on the door, there came loud barking from inside that made us jump, followed by shouting. The door flew open, and Mr. Dean was standing there, holding back their monster of a dog by the collar, who just barking at us like crazy. Shut the hell up, he yelled down at it. It quietened down, but growled under its breath. What do you want? Hello, sir, I stuttered. We're asking around to see if anyone has seen my neighbor's dog. I took out the photo. He went missing yesterday. Well, what makes you think I had anything to do with it? He snapped. It's not like that, sir, said Luke. We're just asking if you've seen him, that's all. He sometimes wanders around the neighborhood. Who do you think you are? He said. Columbo or something? Luke and I turned to each other like it had been a bad idea. We're sorry to have bothered you, sir, I said, turning to leave. Believe me, he said. If that rat had been anywhere near here, Kane would have sorted it out. The dog started barking again, and we hurried back down the path. I don't want to see you boys on my property again. He yelled after us. I won't hold him back next time. He laughed loudly as we quickly rode away, my heart beating hard. We stopped around the corner to catch our breath. Then we started to laugh uncomfortably. God, I hate that family, said Luke. We heard the roar of an engine and a rust bucket of a car came hurtling around the corner, its tires screeching on the road. It was Tommy Dean behind the wheel. When he noticed Luke and I, he gave us the finger and sped away out of sight. So suspicious, I said, but maybe too obvious? Luke shrugged. They're assholes, but I think we need to investigate more first. When it felt like we'd exhausted all avenues in town, I suggested we look in the woods. Luke was apprehensive, as, like me, he was forbidden from the woods without an adult. But it seemed logical that a dog would be drawn to the woods, especially with all the chipmunks the chase. If we do find Milo there, I said, we'll just pretend we found him someplace that won't get us in trouble. We looked around for an hour or so, shouting Milo's name from time to time. He got to the point where we figured if Milo was somewhere he could hear us, he would have made himself known by now. Before we left, we both confessed to needing the bathroom badly, so we went in opposite directions to find a secluded spot to pee. Ricky! I heard Luke scream after a few minutes. I quickly finished and retrieved my bike. Where are you? I yelled, my nerves on edge. Over here! I saw him standing in a small clearing and rushed over. What is it? I asked, out of breath. 
he didn't answer. Luke had found what looked like the site of a sacrificial ritual. There were strange symbols drawn onto several tree trunks and what appeared to be blood. In the center was a slab of stone with a chalk drawing of three triangles, all pointing the same way but overlapping each other. In the center of that was a severed animal paw. It had the same auburn color fur as Milo's. Oh my god, I said quietly. I really want to leave now, said Luke in an almost whisper. I nodded. Yeah, come on. As I went to pick up my bike, I saw a small satchel sitting by a log. I walked over to it, Luke spotting it too. Leave it, Ricky, he said. It's evidence, I said, about to pick it up. But then I remembered not to contaminate it. I used the stick to lift the flap open and peek inside. There was a pack of cigarettes and some school textbooks, senior biology and math. Student, I said. I found a large leaf and used it to cover my fingertips, opening the first page of the biology book. Written in pencil in the top right corner, Tommy Dean. A shiver went through me as I told Luke. We got on our bikes and rode like the wind, heading straight to the sheriff's office. We burst in and both started yelling. Whoa, fellas, said Deputy Campbell from behind his desk. Calm yourselves. Now, what seems to be the problem? We explained everything. Luke and I were escorted back to the woods to show the deputy what we had found. Sweet mother of Jesus, he said, calling it in. There was a search conducted at the dean's house. Inside Tommy's bedroom, they not only found an ancient book of the occult containing the very symbols found at the scene, but also Milo's collar. Apparently, he protested his innocence as they took him in for questioning. I heard all of this through the walls as my parents talked about it that night, having been banished to my room. Poor Mr. Page was devastated. The disturbing nature of it rocked our sleepy community, but Luke and I were commended for our help in the investigation. We both received honorary badges from the Sheriff's Department making us feel like real investigators. After a couple of days, Miss Jacobs required our services again. My mom was reluctant for me to carry on playing detective, as she called it, but my dad talked her around. Luke and I went to visit Miss Jacobs late afternoon and were greeted by a wonderful smell. Take a seat, boys, she said. I baked you a blackberry pie. Call it a thank you for your services to the community. Thanks, Miss Jacobs, we both said together, excitedly sitting in the dining table, where a warm pie sat in the center. She cut two slices and plated them up, handing us one each. Bon appetit, she smiled, taking a seat as we started tucking into the delicious pie. Well done on your investigation. That must have been quite a shock, discovering such a gruesome scene. Luke nodded. It was scary, wasn't it, Ricky? Yeah, I agreed. But we handled it like professionals. She chuckled. I'm sure you did. I always knew that Tommy Dean was a rotten apple. I can't help but wonder what it was all for, though. Why sacrifice that little dog? We looked at each other and shrugged with mouthfuls of pie. And those symbols, what did they mean? My dad said it was devil worship, said Luke. I'm sure he's right, she said. To think, I'd only seen that poor dog a few hours before Tommy took him. I can't help but think I could have done something to help. You couldn't have known, Miss Jacobs, I said. It's not your fault. She patted my hand. Thank goodness you heroes found those school books of his at the scene. 
Imagine what else he could have done if it weren't for you. I dread to think. Luke and I looked at each other and smiled with pride. Excuse me a moment, she said. I'll be right back. We're heroes, I chuckled when she'd left the room. We found the villain and saved the day, Luke giggled. As we kept tucking in, I couldn't help but feel like something wasn't quite right. Then it hit me. Wait, didn't Miss Jacobs say she hadn't seen Milo for a few days when we were investigating? He shrugged. Yeah, so? But she just said she saw him a few hours before Tommy took him. His brow furrowed. Oh yeah, she's an old lady though, Ricky. My grandma is very forgetful. I contemplated it, but it still didn't feel right. My eyes widened. The sheriff's department didn't release the evidence, I said quietly. How does she know about the books? Luke's eyes widened to match mine as Miss Jacobs came back into the room. Will you look at that, she said. You've almost finished your pie. Let me cut you another slice. No, I said, clearing my throat. It was delicious, but very filling. Very well, she smiled. Let me take this dish away then. When she lifted the pie dish, Luke and I both stared in horror. Scratched in the wooden table, were three triangles overlapping each other. Oh yes, she said. There was a mystery for you to solve. A mystery ingredient. I wonder if you've got the detective skills to work it out. Luke looked at me like he was about to cry. And I felt exactly the same. He coughed a little and put his fingers to his mouth, pulling something out. What is it, Luke? She said. He covered his mouth like he was about to puke. Hair. Clue number one, she said. And you, Ricky? I shook my head. We'd like to leave now, Miss Jacobs. Nonsense, she said. She took my plate away and put the pie dish in front of me. Go on, have a look. I looked at Luke, who was clearly terrified. My hands were shaking as I picked up the fork and pulled pieces of pastry away. As I searched through the thick, dark purple filling, my fork made a clink sound. I picked it out with my fingers. I could instantly feel what it was. A long, canine tooth. I threw it across the table and pushed myself back, grabbing Luke's arm. As we made a run for the door, it slammed shut and the light that had been coming through the windows dimmed. The symbol on the table began to glow as if it was drawn in embers. Luke and I had our arms around each other as we sniveled, not being able to comprehend what was happening. Miss Jacobs smiled from across the room, her hair flowing as if caught in a breeze. What are your findings? She asked. The Brook Street Sleuths must be able to figure it out. You killed Milo, I shouted, and, and... The thought of it made me sick. Bravo, she clapped. Make the sacrifice, feed the innocent. But why? screamed Luke. I am far older than any human should be, she cackled. That takes a bit of dark magic to maintain. She grabbed Luke, and I tried to pull him away from her, but with a flick of her hand, I was forced against the wall. She threw him down onto the symbol, and he screamed out as smoke began to rise around him. It burns, he screamed in pain. Leave him alone, I cried. But she turned to me. The features that made her Miss Jacobs faded, revealing something ancient and decayed. Loose skin hung from visible bones, empty sockets, wispy strands of hair, teeth surrounded by split, leathery gums. 
You're next, Ricky, she yelled, deep and demonic. Her mouth opened wide, and she took Luke's whole head inside. His arms and legs began to kick about as I could hear muffled groans coming from inside her. There were snapping sounds as part of her dislocated like a snake to swallow him whole. Before long, his shoulders could no longer be seen. She made greedy, guttural noises as she forced his body down her throat. I was paralyzed against the wall, forced to watch as my best friend was eaten alive. I could feel my mind snapping like her ancient bones. Luke's legs were still kicking as she reached his knees, and her long, bony fingers gripped around his ankles to push the last bit of him inside. There came a loud bang, something that startled her as well as me. The door to the dining room flew open, and three officers burst into the room led by Deputy Campbell. Jesus, he yelled, taking aim at what was once Miss Jacobs. She retched, and Luke's whole body slipped out of her, collapsing on the table in a cocoon of translucent goo. I fell from the wall and hit the floor hard as the officers opened fire on her, forcing her back with a multi-layered scream. The window shattered and natural light poured in, making her scream even louder, as if burnt by the rays. I ran to Luke and pulled him from the table, relieved when he was still breathing. The glowing symbol was fading, and with a final shriek, the former Miss Jacobs became a cloud of smoke that was seemingly sucked into the symbol. Then, everything went deathly silent for a few seconds. As it happened, Tommy Dean had managed to convince the sheriff to investigate Miss Jacobs. He insisted that he had seen her on his property, and that his satchel couldn't be found afterwards. Thank God he did, because Luke and I would not be here today if it wasn't for him. We carry the mental scars, but we live. Suffice to say, the Brook Street sleuths were no more after that day.